Time to re-up YouTube, your boy Young Mustard is back with another video. Now yesterday marked the four year anniversary of the PG to Los Angeles trade. Obviously Kawhi Leonard as well going there, but the bigger move was PG because of how hefty the haul was. The trade was Paul George by himself coming off of his 2019 season with the Oklahoma City Thunder where he finished third in the MVP voting in exchange for a young Shea Gilgis Alexander, Danilo Gallinari, four unprotected first round picks, a lottery protected first round pick from Miami and two first round pick swaps from the Clippers as well. So essentially seven first round picks and Shea Gilgis Alexander all for just Paul George himself. And honestly looking back on it I think everybody can say that the Thunder have won this trade so far. Now obviously the Clippers still have time and it's not like Paul George is trash and he's gonna just fall off a cliff tomorrow. PG may not be the same player that he was in 2019 but the facts of the matter remain that he's still an all-star caliber player and is one of the best players in the league. His game is not reliant on athleticism and despite the injury concerns which we will get to later, I think it's safe to say that unless he suffers another catastrophic injury which isn't out of the realm of possibility considering his past, I think it's safe to say that PG can still be a high impact player for the next couple of years to give the Clippers a fighting chance to win a championship with this duo. But I still have to be honest, the Thunder right now look like the clear cut winners of this trade especially considering the future of this OK KC team going forward and the potential moves they could make with the young pieces on the roster. Because when you look at the OKC Thunder, I have to say for starters, Shea Gilgis Alexander is a noticeably better player than Paul George and he's much younger than PG is at this moment. Shea is about to be a 25 year old guard in a couple of days that is one of the greatest players in this league today. He just finished a season where he averaged over 30 points per game on insane efficiency of nearly 63% true shooting and did this on a team that didn't even give him ample floor spacing while he is not even a floor spacer himself. He's someone that likes to attack the basket and get his teammates involved due to his relentless rim pressure. When you're going out there with guys like Lou Dort, Josh Giddy, and Jalen Williams, it's no surprise that people are very impressed with how effective he is as a scorer in that kind of situation. Then you throw in the fact that there's no real reliable role threat or great screener on this roster and it even becomes that much more impressive. And I'm not saying that to say the talent on this team is completely scarce because when you look up and down this roster, there is potential all over the place. Josh Giddy looks like he could be a very useful player on the offensive side of the ball. Jalen Williams looks like he could have two-way impact. And let's not forget their number two overall pick, Chet Holmgren, who looks like he has a lot of upside primarily on the defensive side of the ball as a great rim protector. When you throw in the young players on this team and the assets at their disposal, some of the assets that they flip the Clippers picks into, I have to say with Shea Gilgis Alexander leading the helm, the Thunder have all these pieces to work with, not only young players, but picks as well, that they could one day even package some of them to get themselves a complimentary co-star or even another better player than Shea to then fast track their way towards a championship while even keeping some of the young players at their disposal. That's the real value in what they gained from the Los Angeles Clippers in that trade. And when you consider the fact that, like I said earlier, PG is not as good as Shea Gilgis Alexander and that became pretty evident very soon. Because now when you look at the Los Angeles Clippers side of things, I think the ultimate defense has to be injuries. Because whether you like Paul George or Kawhi Leonard, the fact remains that both of them are just not healthy players whatsoever. PG has not played 60 games in an NBA season since his 2019 year, the year before he was a Los Angeles Clipper where he finished third in the MVP race, the quote unquote MVPG season. And in the case of Kawhi Leonard, we just saw another playoffs where he essentially missed the whole thing after two games with another meniscus tear. These guys are as fragile as it gets and for those two to be the centerpieces of your franchise, it's tough, I'm not gonna lie. Because as we all know, this isn't the first time in the playoffs where they've been without one or both of their stars. But it's tough for me to really cut the Clippers slack in this scenario, especially when we're talking about this trade, because I'm not gonna lie, even if you think that Shea Gilgis Alexander becoming this star player that was a borderline top 10 player this past season was an unpredictable thing that the Clippers couldn't have seen coming, that's fine. But when you're talking about injuries, I'm sorry, that's something that one could have predicted even before they got to LA. Kawhi Leonard has been load managing his whole career and has still had his fair share of injuries in San Antonio and Toronto. And in the case of Paul George, of course he wasn't as injury prone then as he is now, as obviously he's older, but he had already suffered 
suffered a major injury years before in Indiana, and in OKC in the postseason of 2019, the year right before they traded for him, he was already dealing with a partially torn rotator cuff. The signs for PG may not have been that glaring, but there were still some signs there, and the man was already approaching 30 years old. And the fact of the matter remains, they had a window to win a championship, and they underperformed in the 2020 playoffs. Whether you want to blame Doc Rivers' poor coaching, Lou Williams' bad defense, and Montrez Harrell's as well, the fact of the matter remains that they were up 3-1 on the Denver Nuggets and Paul George hit the side of a backboard in Game 7 along with Kawhi Leonard not showing up in that Game 7 as well. This was a team that was supposed to come together and win immediately and Paul George himself even said that and then backtracked after they blew that 3-1 lead. Get it done or bust or is it patience within said two years or three year time? I think immediately we expected to come in and 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 win it all. Like we we didn't have no other um like hey this is gonna take a year to get used to one another. A few moments later. But I think internally we we we've always felt um this is not a championship or bust year for us. Not only did their players underperform, but they literally put together a roster of Lou Williams and Montrez Harrell as their main third and fourth pieces on the roster and thought that come postseason time that was actually going to work in a conference that had Anthony Davis and Nikola Jokic as the big men that they were going to have to more than likely run into come postseason time. A small part of poor team management, injuries, and just underperforming comes into why the Clippers have failed this Paul George and Kawhi Leonard era. I mean, they only have one conference finals to show for it and the standards are so low for this franchise that that was a big step forward for them as they've never seen a conference final since or beforehand. Now I will say as well one thing that many people are not talking about is the financial commitment that they're going to have to make to this duo over the next four to five seasons. Kawhi Leonard who missed a full season two years ago and two postseasons so far as a clipper while being unable to play 60 games in any of these regular seasons so far since joining the franchise, along with Paul George, who has also been unable to do that while missing two postseasons back to back, I should add, they are both potentially on expiring contracts as they have a player option after the 23 to 24 NBA season. Now, there's a good chance that even if they fail in the 24 NBA season, they could just opt in and try to run it back one last time with this duo and team. But there's a good chance that it just takes one more playoff failure for this duo to say, I'm done, I don't want to be here anymore. And that's when the real pain of those 2025 and 2026 picks that they gave up is going to really come back to bite this team in the ass because even with PG and Kawhi, they were at risk of having a bad season because of their injury history, but at least you had them under contract to give you some level of security. If they walk, the Clippers are completely screwed over. And unless they were to land some free agent or get somebody through a sign and trade with one of the two players or both of them, there would be no way they can just rebuild that team. They would be relying on role players and probably some second round pick to put faith in. And the alternative would be to give a max extension to Kawhi Leonard and Paul George because you know they're going to demand it with all that leverage. And like I said earlier, even if the Clippers are willing to give them that max extension, there's a good chance that they may not want to be there, especially if they fail at another championship opportunity next season. You just know that Sam Presti and OKC is licking his chops with the Birdman rub hands waiting for the Clippers to fold and lose out on both of these guys. Now does that mean that this is actually the worst trade in NBA history as the title says? No. Because at the end of the day the Clippers are still contenders in the Western Conference. Even if you want to say that the injuries put them out of contention, you can never just fully dismiss the Los Angeles Clippers because it just takes one postseason for them to be healthy for them to put it all together and finally make that championship push. Kawhi Leonard when healthy, especially come postseason time, is arguably a top five player in the league. And as hard as Paul George has declined, primarily due to injuries and age, he is still a great second option for him to have on the team. And with the supporting cast that has solid pieces like Zubach, Terrence Mann, Norman Powell, Russell Westbrook, I think it's safe to say that if they are ever fully healthy going into the postseason with this roster, I'm not gonna lie, they are obviously 
likely going to be a threat to win the championship or at the bare minimum come out of the Western Conference. But as of now, when it comes to the grading of this trade four years later, I'm going to give the Clippers a D and I'm going to give the Thunder an A+. But as far as if this is the worst trade in NBA history, let's still not forget that the Nets and the Celtics made arguably one of the worst trades in sports history, giving up KG, Jason Terry, and Paul Pierce, players that aren't even in the league anymore in exchange for picks that ended up becoming the core of the Boston Celtics team right now. Or hell, you could even look at the James Harden to Houston trade. That's another one that you could argue is the worst trade in history as well, especially considering how it panned out for both teams. But A, those are just my thoughts on the PG trade. The question of the day is what are your thoughts on the Paul George trade four years later? Do you think the Thunder won? The Clippers won? Do you think they both won? Or hell, do you think that they both lost? I want to know what you guys' opinions are down below in the comment section. This is your boy Young Muster signing out. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Y'all stay safe. Have a blessed day. Peace.